Um, so what is SDR? SDR is, instead of, it stands for software defined radio. And it, you, so you take at one r radio transmitter slash receiver piece of hardware, and you can use that for pretty much everything. So a traditional radio receiver like this, which by the way, the internet is really bad at providing good clear block diagrams of radio receivers and software defined radios. But so effectively what works is over here you have an, this is your antenna, which would be this here, an amplifier to make the signal stronger, which goes through a mixer to then shift it, the signal coming in from a high frequency of up to, in the case of this radio, it goes up to 6 gigahertz, and this one goes to 3 gigahertz. And that will shift it down, so the, it'll shift the whole band down to be centered around 0 hertz. Then it'll go through a filter, in which just helps clean up the signal and another amplifier. So up until here, most software-defined radios are the same. But here in the demodulator, in this case this is an FM or AM radio that we're looking at, the demodulator and audio amplifier, this would all be done in software. So with one piece of radio hardware, using software instead of hardware, so you need a more powerful computer. So software-defined radio isn't used for low-cost stuff. It's typically used for research stuff and also uh, security because wireless has a lot of vulnerabilities to it that you'll see. Um, but with this it makes it really easy to tweak things and you can look at things very easily. So I'll show some of that too. Um, here's another baddish block diagram of software defined radio. Again antenna, the RF har hardware, and they have an analog to digital converter and a digital to analog converter. And then pretty much everything after it is in software. Um, as far as hardware goes, there's all sorts of price ranges depending on how much you want to spend and what you have available, or not what you need. Um, the lowest cost one is the RTL, it's called the Realtek dongle, the RTL 2832U. You can buy these on eBay or Amazon or wherever, it's this. These are actually really cool. They cost, you can get them on eBay for less than $10. And they were originally designed as a TV tuner dongle for the European TV standard. You cannot use these to receive TV in America, be, or digital TV, because this doesn't have wide enough bandwidth. But these are really great if you want to get started, and you aren't sure if you'll like it, because they're less than $10. So essentially, minimal investment. And it goes from around 24 to 1600 to 1900 megahertz. So in that band, there's F FM radio. You'll have um, a lot of the radio used for um, commercial industries, um, wireless microphones like what I'm wearing now, um, remotes and stuff for ceiling fans and other appliances. So you have all sorts of things in that band. The one thing this doesn't have is the noise floor isn't the lowest. So it's not designed to be a well performance, S good performing SDR. It's designed to work as a TV tuner dongle. And then as you go up in price, there's the Hack RF1 and the Blade RF. I have the Blade RF here. The nice thing about the more expensive things, so everything below the Hack RF1 up here, they can transmit and receive. So the Blade RF, I can transmit as well as receive. Um, the Hack RF, you can also do that, but it's half duplex, so you can only do one at a time. Um, if you want, I'll pass this around so you can look at it. Um, this is the dongle. And then it, as cost goes up, you can get things like the USRP, B, this is the B200, um, and then there are other things too. Now, the software part. So a lot of the software is done using GNU Radio, which is a framework for it lets you do a few things. It lets you transfer, it's really just a way of timing and handling processing of data. It's used for software defined radio because that's what it's designed for, but you can use it for audio stuff or other stuff. Um, on, in that, you'll have something called GR Osmo SDR, which is effectively the drivers that let you interface a hardware radio with the software. But the problem with these is you have to write a lot of your own stuff to do basic things. So there are other things like what I'll be using is I'll be using GQRX, which lets you view the spectrum, and it will also let you demodulate FM 
AM, and a few other modulations. On Windows, a popular one is SDR Sharp, but I'm not going to be using that, and I don't think we need to cover it since this is Linux. Um, also, what's cool is for Android, there is stuff that you can use. There's SDR Touch, which is free slash a paid upgrade version. There's also, I don't have it on here, I didn't update the slide since it was released. There's something called RF Analyzer, which is really nice. You have to either pay for it on the Google Play Store, or you can get it on GitHub for free. And it is a nice app, and it lets you demodulate stuff. Um, it uses either the RTL SDR dongle or a um, hack RF, and use USB on the go cable for that. So I'm going to show you looking at some things, and we're just going to go through this quickly. Then I'll look at the actual spectrum and do some stuff in GNU Radio. So this here is FM broadcast. What's cool about this is, so what you're looking at here, it's called uh, Osmocom FFT slash Phosphor, with Phosphor with an F. And it uses a um, actually G GPU acceleration to give you a really fast FFT. So this is FM radio, and in here you can actually see this is people talking or the music or whatever's being broadcast. And then these two bands out here, these are actually HD radio. So FM has some really cool stuff with it about RDS, or radio data service, which is in your car, how it says what's playing on the station, and HD radio. HD radio, the specification isn't open. But if you tune to it, it just sounds like noise. So if you have an old receiver, you won't hear anything. And it's outside the bandwidth of the signal, so you don't hear it and it doesn't interfere. This is Wi-Fi, or, and one other thing, this was done using the RTL SDR. This is Wi-Fi. So in this case, it's using a 20 megahertz channel bandwidth. You can see that's that channel here. And in this case, a bunch of data is being sent, so all the frames stack up, and there's not much not in use. This is a microwave oven. And this is outside the microwave. I think it was a few meters away. Microwaves just pump a ton of RF energy into what's inside them. And while they are shielded pretty well, and RF energy still will get out. So what you see here is this is pulsing. This here is some pulsing to however our microwave drives the magnetron. And the problem is this is right at 2.45 gigahertz, but it's pretty wide bandwidth, high powered noise. So this is a micro, our microwave over here next to a Wi-Fi um, channel. And this doesn't look as bad, I believe, as further away, but you can get problems with interference, and that's one of the things that you'll see. So now I'll do some demos. So right now I'm using the USRP which is this one here. So this is looking at, this has a bandwidth of around 32 megahertz. And right now you're looking at the entire FM broadcast, or pretty much the entire FM broadcast band. So here's like the low end at 87.9 megahertz, was right around here, up to 110 megahertz. Um, some of this other stuff you're seeing here is actually what's called ali aliasing which is where the mixer is designed to down-convert the signal. A perfect mixer would, or not a perfect one. The, mix, the way the mixer works is it effectively multiplies the input signal by a sine wave, which results in it shifting the frequency down by the value of that si the frequency of that sine wave. But it will also do stuff with the rest of the spectrum. So you'll get what's called aliasing, which is where this signal, this big P, or peak here, if we just tune up the frequency a little, so right now it's centered at about 106-ish megahertz. If we shift the frequency, it doesn't, or earlier I looked at this, it doesn't really move and you'll get weirdness. So you can tell that that's aliasing. In this case, I believe it's ATSC, which is the North American Digital TV Protocol. Another thing you can tell is it's very susceptible to multipath. So if you move your hand, like if you just move the antenna, you'll see that happens. Yes? So has anybody written a software uh, theremin to play with it? I talked with someone about that, and they haven't, but I, they, they said they wanted to do it, and you totally could do it. Um, yeah. So, this, so what's cool about Phosphor here, too, is that you can see, so this is the whole FM broadcast band, and you can actually see the voice data as it's being transmitted. So right now we can see 
Um, there's so you can see the stuff. There's some other packet like bursty packet stuff here that may or may not be aliasing. Um, it can be hard to tell with stuff like that. So if you look how this peak over here, so this starts at about 86 megahertz and goes over like that, it 100. That's no longer there. That's an example of alias aliasing. Another populated spectrum of the band is 900, the 900 megahertz band, which it goes from about 900 to 920 megahertz. So here you'll see over here are pagers at around 929 megahertz. Then over here you will see things like um, just wireless devices. Um, some remotes for appliances are in this band. Um, smart meters use this band. Um, so Zigbee and other things like that will too. If we can turn up the gain, we can see stuff. So if you look, there's a very, these lines here, these are very fast packets being sent. And you can see they show up here. This is some other stuff. You can also go to um, 300 megahertz, or like 300, 3, like let's do 316 center. So in the 300 megahertz band, sometimes you'll see some stuff. Um, car key fobs commonly operate in this band. Car key fobs are cool because the car will, when you go and push the button on your car to unlock it, if you have keyless entry, what will happen is the car will send out a signal to the key fob at 125 kilohertz. So really low frequency. Is that, are you clicking that? Yeah, I'm, I'm the first one there. I'm on the left? Okay, so yeah, we can actually see your thing. Yeah. So, and then it will transmit that out. So actually, if you want, we can, if you have wireless devices, we can look at them. One really nice website that someone made is it's a website called FCC.io. Um, yeah, like yeah, so if you haven't heard of FCC.io, it's a really cool website where you just go to FCC.io, then forward slash the FCC ID of the product which you can find, it's simply printed on the back or somewhere. And if you go there, I'm not sure what this is. Um, it'll go to the FCC search thing, and you can view the test reports for it, which have a lot of fun information, including internal and external photos, and when it loads. The FCC website's a real pain to find the search thing, so FCC.io is nice. So this is, um, I think this is a wireless uh, speaker thing I was looking at. Um, but if you look at, or if you look, so you can see internal photos, which for this aren't that interesting. There's a test report, too. This is the remote for a ceiling fan at our house. And so the test reports are really nice because they give you a lot of information about the product. And you don't have to even get out a radio to do anything with it. So if we go to this, it'll show the search page. And so or the first thing we see is the frequency. So it's 433.9 megahertz. That's another band you'll see commonly used. It's more common in Europe, typically, but you'll see it used in the US for things, too. So we can look at internal and external photos, as well as the test report. So here we can see internal. So you can see external photos of the remote. And then we can also see internal photos of the PCB and stuff. What's nice about the FCC test reports is some, typically the photos are clear enough where you can kind of make out the part numbers on the, the ICs inside them. And the test report has a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you can just, typically, I just scroll to the end where all the graphs are. But if you, so if you look at, so there are a few things. This will show you the bandwidth measurement. So it go, goes really close on the signal. So if you, do you want to click your remote again? Sure. So if you look, you'll see that there are two separate peaks. So that uses a modulation called FSK, or fre frequency shift keying. And what that is, is one frequency will mean a 0. The other frequency me will mean a 1, and it will shift between them. Another, so you can typically tell in the test report here, so you can look at the spectrum, or this is the spectrum, but in the test report, and you'll typically see two peaks. This is what's amplitude shift keying or on-off keying, which is where it just 
sends RF than doesn't. This one isn't the best example, but you can see here's a burst of the RF. So we can look at that too. Is this you or is that someone else? Mine is not in that range. Okay. <laughs> Someone go check all the cars in the parking lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so cars, there are some attacks against these. Um, at DEF CON, there's a talk about it. Some attack, and that actually didn't use software-defined radio, but you could totally do it with software-defined radio. Um, but so actually, I'm going to start GNU Radio Companion. So GNU Radio also has this thing called GNU Radio Companion, which it lets you connect these blocks and make a flow graph so you can process the RF stuff without having to write a lot of code, which is nice. So an interesting thing is a lot of stuff for RF isn't encrypted, like the ceiling fan remote, which I don't have it with me, sadly. But it's a very simple data format. of, uh, So it uses the pulse width. So it will have a short pulse for 0, a long pulse for 1. And it w that's how it encodes da the data, which for a ceiling, something like a ceiling fan is fine. But there are other things where you definitely want more security that or It's really not the modulation, but it's the encryption. So you could very easily write something. It only has four bits of IDs, so you'd have 16 total addresses. So if you wanted to annoy your neighbors and you know what mo knew what model ceiling fan you had, you could get an amplifier. These don't have too high of a transmit power, but you could get a higher powered amplifier. Now, the if you get got caught, the FCC could go after you. So don't do this, <laughs> and don't sue me. But you could go and actually transmit the. Um, transmit over there, or transmit the thing to turn it on, turn it off, turn the light on or off, or the fan on or off. Let's see. OK. So actually, here you can see this is, it's at 518 megahertz. So let's decrease the sample rate. So right now, you're seeing the, the wireless microphone I'm wearing. And you can see the modulation as I talk. What's also interesting is it has a. Um, if you notice, it's all be silence, you can see. But it has this wobble in it, which I'm not sure why that is. Actually, what's also interesting is, so what's happening is, if I move, as I, if, let's see. So if I move closer to it, and, or if I talk, let's see. So what's interesting is over here, what you're seeing are actually spurious emissions. So in the process of creating the RF signal, it will actually, yeah, if I get close enough, and I talk loud enough. Oh yeah, there's a lot of that. So you, so these are actually these in, in this case are unwanted signals, but there's actually people are looking into like from displays and keyboards and other things, looking at the, these spurious emissions and trying to decode data from them. So in say your laptop screen, there's a digital interface going to the screen, and if you can figure out the rate at which the data is being sent, and it's going to be a square wave. And square waves have lots of harmonics and other peaks at other frequencies. So what will happen is, if you, it, if you can get it working, there, I don't think there was one talk I saw about it where they had it kind of working, but it's not easy to do. But what will happen is, you can actually potentially view someone's screen remotely just using software-defined radio. And this is where software-defined radio really exceeds at making something else that it'd be a real pain to build a hardware receiver for it. So what I think the wobble in the frequency here is, is a way of the tr microphone transmitter and receiver to identify themselves with each other and know that it's not some other source. I'm not entirely sure, though. Um, but it's interesting is when I stop talking, this, the emission over here kind of, or I guess it's probably me moving in more than anything. But yeah. So, and these are things. So let's see, because GNU, GNU Radio has started. So I'll close this so I stop using it. Um, no, it's. Fun. Okay, so we said that that remote was around. 315 megahertz. Our sample rate is 2 meg. Um, yes, let me just adjust this. 
Okay. I'll, yeah, that should. Err. So this is GNU Radio Companion. Right now, I have a fairly simple flow graph to, um, all this will do, all this does is it takes in the RF signal, which is a complex waveform, which it's actually not that confusing. It's just a way of send, storing or sampling the data in a way that makes it easier to do signal processing on. Um, and let me just set this up. So right now I'm creating a variable slider thing so I can adjust the frequency without having to restart this. Um, okay, and that should be good. So and def oh, default value should be 315 E6. So you also need to use scientific no notation in this. So what this will do is GNU Radio Companion will take this flow graph. It will then generate Python code that will get run through GNU Radio. Um, the Python code, I believe, doesn't do the signal processing. I believe that's all done in C code. But the Python lets you set up how it should work. So what's happening here is this is our source, which gets the data from the radio. We then multiply it times a sine wave to center the signal. So some radios, like this RTL SDR, have problems with what's called a DC offset, or the IF feed through, which is where at zero hertz, which, because what will happen is when you mix it, it's shifted down to around zero hertz, but you'll have negative frequency, which is because you have complex signals and you have your real and imaginary part of it, you can actually have negative frequencies and positive frequencies, which are useful for this, but otherwise are kind of confusing. Um, so what this does is it will take the signal in, shift it, offset the signal over, because we're going to only look at the section in the center. And the reason you do that is, if I can get this working, there will be this radio and a lot of software-defined radios will have some big peak at zero hertz, which is DC. And that will actually, to keep that out of our signal we're looking at, it shifts it over and then we'll filter it out. This is the filter that gets rid of it. Then this goes from a complex number, which is effectively, if you have a, imagine you have a slinky and it spirals around, that's the complex, num that's the complex waveform with the real and imaginary axes. And when you look at it in the real axis, you're only looking at one side, so you see a sine wave. And what this does is it takes, but we care about the amplitude. And the complex numbers make demodulating AM radio really easy and cool, because instead of having to maybe average it out to smooth out the signal, with complex numbers, what you do is you just take the, because it's a circle going around, you actually just take the distance from the center to that point, the magnitude of it, which you can do by with the Pythagorean the theorem of the square and then taking the square root. Or what we can do is we can actually just square it and say it's close enough, which is what we're doing here. So this will run, and it should work. So it's loading the FPGA image on here. Again. Good. Now let's see. Um, so you have to set up the trigger on the scope view that it uses, which is a little annoying, but it's still not too. And I need to change the. Could you click your remote? Okay, that's good. So if we change the, so I turn off auto range. Okay, so right, right now I'm just scaling it so it fits well. Could you click it again? Okay, so right now what we can see here is if we increase the time and the amplitude and move this down. So because we're really close, there's a strong signal. Uh, could you do it again, please? Okay, so uh, let's see, do we have that? Okay, yeah, so what we can see here is this is the signal from his remote, so it's using amplitude shift keying. 
And if it's done well, this will be doing rolling using rolling codes. So that the way there's a system called Keylock, K E E L O Q, which there was a talk at DEF CON this year by Sammy Kamar. Um, he talked about this. And so the, the, he did a talk about it. What's interesting about it, though, is that it doesn't, it has a, it effectively transmits the, authentic, the rolling code. And then it has, I think, three or four data bits that it sends, say, lock, unlock, alarm, whatever. The problem is there's no signing or anything, which means that you can intercept the code either by jamming the signal, by jamming it and capturing the signal by being slightly off the frequency so you can receive it, but the cars, um, so what will happen is in the frequency bandwidth, the car's receiver will have a certain bandwidth, and if you can get a better resolution with your radio, you can then transmit really close to the key fob on one frequency and jam it to the car, which if it's wider will work, and then listen where the key fob actually is next to it. So you'll listen, record one code, then the user will, oh, it didn't work, click it again, so you'll get a second code. And once you get the second code, you play the first code to the car so it does what you want, and you still have a second code, which you could then change the bits on it to have it unlock the car. I believe there are other versions of the rolling code thing that fix this problem, but it is something to be aware of. Could you do it one more time to get a longer time scale? Okay. So what you can see here is that this uses on-off keying by sending either a, it just either doesn't send any signal at all or sends a signal. And we can see that it has a series of pulses. And if you notice, there are these wide pulses here and narrow pulses. So the way a uh, receiver typically works is there's a section at the beginning, which is the preamble. And then after the preamble, you'll have your data. And the preamble, like for the remote I showed you, it was just two bits. It was a 0, 1. And then it had seven bits of data, or no. It had four bits of ID and seven bits of data for our ceiling fan remote, which doesn't use a rolling code thing, because your ceiling fan really doesn't need a rolling code. But this one, I'm guessing this is the preamble here. What's interesting is if you look at this, you can actually see the pulse time of while well, it's both sending a signal and not sending the signal change. So here it's a short off pulse, whereas here it's a longer one and then short. So what I'm guessing, I'm not sure, is the signal works by actually what it's probably doing is sending, is it could be, I'm not sure how it's encoding the data, but it could be doing it where it does the width of each one. So you have it, this would be a one, like one, zero, one, 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 zero. Or it could be where it uses a combination of the on and off time. Um, could I look at your keys? Do you mind if I let them see the FCC ID of it? OK. So we can actually look up the FCC ID of this, which is uh, C W T W B. 1, U8, 2, 1. So we can see, yeah, the frequency is 315 megahertz. There is a slight offset, which could either be from, it's probably from this. Um, there may be offset in this. I haven't measured it, but it's, typically these use a, a good enough oscillator in them to be close enough. Um, Oh, yeah, 315. No, 315. This is actually, yeah, it is 315, exactly. I, this, is, this is the gain up here. So this is, we can look at the test report for this. And let's see. So sometimes they'll describe, let's see, do they have any graphs? See, so yeah, actually, here are the internal photos of it. So just here's the PCB and the buttons for it. And it actually, this is an example of the FCC ID photos being really nice, or the, F, not FCC, the FCC test report. You can actually see this is a microchip part, and you can read the part number off there. That's just a 12F microcontroller. So it may have some RF part to it, too. So microcontroller, this is the oscillator crystal thing. And then 
this big loop around here, this trace here is the antenna. Um, so what they could be doing, um, here are your keys. They could either be doing something where they use an RF microcontroller here, or what they did for the ceiling fan remote, which I, or what I believe they did, is they use a cheap microcontroller that you can, like, a really cheap one. And they actually have it turn the oscillator on and off. And the oscillator is tuned to for the, our remote, 433 megahertz. So it just turns the oscillator on and off. Um, sometimes you can get schematics, but typically they'll file a confidentiality request with FCC, so you won't get schematics. Um, but yeah, so here in the FCC test report, we can see quite a lot. Um, so here you can see the, the pretty much the same view as we saw over here, but narrower. And then this is a wider uh, time span. Here you can actually see the bursts from it, and then down here you can see the. Um, oh, it was here. Here you can see the signal being transmitted. So here it's a single peak, so you know it's not really doing any frequency shifting stuff, and it's probably amplitude in this case it is. Um, if we go out, yeah. So here you can actually see the packet structure better. So this is probably some preamble here. The preamble actually serves two purposes. One of them is to, for longer, pa for longer packet sizes, it's more important. One is to identify the packet from noise and know the zero, or it's zero, one, zero, one, or whatever pattern that's distinct and hopefully isn't noise. But even if noise triggers it, the other thing that it's useful for is to lock on, depending on the receiver's design, you'll have an oscillator in the receiver, and that oscillator will lock itself on to the preamble. So it can then sample the bits at the correct time and remain in sync through the packet. Um, typically, then you'll see an ID or something. So could you click that again? Yeah, this is hard. So what I'd actually probably do is capture this into a, um, like actually sample the data. And then you can store the data into either like a, a wave file and put it into Audacity or something. Or use another tool called Bodline which will let you do the same thing. Um, Bodline, it um, has some weird limitations, but it's a nice tool. Um, so this is the RX one. The transmit one, I'll show you, but I won't actually transmit. I'll just send it to the scope, so we don't have any regulatory problems. So all this does, this will transmit the ceiling fan remote. It generates, uh, this is the important part here. I It will take the It'll generate the, the bits, so it, I set it up to where the sample rate times other stuff I'll show you. What each that each uh, uh, lo memory location, I forget the word, in this array is one zero or one pulse width. So in this case, a one zero for the remote we add would be a zero, and a one one zero would be a one. So it'd be a short pulse is a zero, long pulse is one. And then this will get, the throttle is just here because it's not going to an actual radio. GNU radio will just say, because it's on software, it's like, hey, you have more data to give me? Great. I'll just throw it over here, and it will go up to 100% CPU usage, which, while exciting, isn't always fun. So the interpolation, in this case, just repeats the signal, in this case, 600 times. So every one here, so this one will become 600 ones. And then I'm doing this at a sample rate of 1.89 mega samples per second. So 600 times, or 1.89 divided by 600 should equal 31.5 thousand bits, or baud bits per second, I believe, which is what the ceiling fan remote uses. Then we just average it to smooth it out, because right now it's a square wave, and that's not, that will spew everywhere with the harmonics. And then here I go from the complex signal back to magnitude, and this could be magnitude squared, it doesn't really matter, to the scope plot. And so I also have a way uh, we can save this out to a file or um, actually, no, that's enabled. I don't want that. Now it's disabled. So you can actually either, you can send this out to a file and do other things with it too, but now this should, executing. 
Another fun thing is if you use USB 2 with your radio, um, in the co console it'll print out an O for buffer overrun if it can't read the data out fast enough at the sample rate you set. So if you set it at a sample rate higher than what USB 2 can handle and you get a huge number bunch of buff buffer overruns, it'll start printing out in the console in the GNU Radio Companion software from which it will after you stop the, this is actually a separate process, even after you kill this, it will continue to print those until it finishes the buffer of all the buffer overruns that have happened, which can take a really long time, and it's not fun waiting for that. So then you typically end up killing the software. Okay, here it is. So this is the ceiling fan thing. So what it does here is it just is a burst of a bunch of them followed by a long off. So the way this works is what will happen is so a short on period is a zero, long on period is one. So for this, in the case of this remote, it's this is the preamble zero one. I'm not sure, I think they're using this more just as a time for it, the receiver to start listening. I don't think they're actually using this to lock on because the timing here is probably forgiving enough. And then these four bits here are the ID. So in this case, it'd be 1111. So all the dip switches are set to 1. And then these seven bits here correspond to, they did this in a very interesting way. There's one bit for each function. So one bit's the light on off. Another bit is fan low, then fan medium, and fan high, and then off, which is weird, because they could have encoded all the buttons in much fewer bits. and it's weird. Um, the receiver, if you send more than one bit as one, which doesn't ever happen with remote, I don't. I believe, if I remember correctly, it will just list, take the first one in the bit order and do that command, and it'll ignore the rest. So it's interesting. Um, but this is the remote, so this you can generate. And right now, this isn't doing anything. But you could actually transmit the signal, and you'd see the light. I believe this is the light that would be blinking. Which your, my parents don't like that. Um, if actually we can send this to a file and look at this. If I just turn this off and I enable this, um, and let me disable repeat so it's not too big. Bodline is also weird in that if the file is over, I believe 50 megabytes, it will just kind of crash, not work. So you'll have to use DD to like go the first however many bytes and stop it, then one 50 megabyte block, then another and another, which is annoying. So this should work. So I'll just run this. And right now, I'm just going to a file, and there's no GUI thing. So this will, actually, there is the slider for the gain to the radio here. But this should run, then stop. Now it should be good, so I'll just cancel this. And I'll open Bodline. Um, how am, I go how am I doing for time? It's 8 o'clock. OK, yeah. So if we open this file, OK, fine. I'll click on a file first. It's a old, the UI on it's old, but it, it's nice for looking at. It's kind of the only thing that really exists. So it's, let's see, no, where, where, actually, where is this file located? Uh, OK. No. Oh, right. It, it is a very old or er, old UI piece of here it is. So here we can set the sample rate to one point eight nine megahertz or mega samples per second. Um so custom one Mm. 
Yes, that should be right. The sample rate doesn't really matter except for the the labeling of the frequency um, or the FFT. It should still work, and then it's 32-bit float, little Indian, two channels, quadrature. So here we can actually see the signal and the bursts, and we can zoom in. Remember. The UI is everything you do through, right, through the right-click menu. And how do you zoom? If we zoom all the way in, and it's doing a high, higher resolution of T. So we can see, actually, even with that filter, there are all of these, the noise in the square wave. I was hoping we'd get higher resolution on this. We can see a little of the, actually, It's like an if you squint type thing. I want that one. Let's see way for yeah. Please there's a hotkey for zoom out. Oh. Okay, here it is. Now I can zoom in. So we can I need to adjust the FFT levels, I think, which I don't remember how to do. I don't use Bodline too much because its UI sucks, and typically I don't have to. But so here you can kind of see the mod, the data, and you can look at the actually see down here the peak moving up and down as this goes. Um, this is why using Audacity is much nicer. So with aud Audacity, all you use with Audacity or something, you take this file and you put a the GNU it has a sync for it. It's a wave file sync. And you just put it in there, save that, and you can look at it in Audacity. Which so we can do this. Um, sample rate. Yeah. Um, let's try this. And then I'll have one last thing. One channel. OK. So I'll do this into here. So for GNU Radio, you just can put down blocks, and then you click and go to connect things. Um, if you search online, there are a, there's a lot of tutorials and information on using it. So this should work. Generating. Executing. That should be long enough. Do hope I have what I think I do. Yes. File. Open. Uh, just read it directly from. So actually, here you can see it. And if we zoom in, so right now we're only looking at the amplitude and not the frequency. But if we zoom in, we can actually see that this is the data that's being sent. And what's nice in Audacity is it's much easier to um, measure the length of things. So you can actually see that this part, this section here, is. Change the units to plus. Should. Yeah. OK, it's this one. I see. Function length. So here you can see that it's, I should, I'm going to set this to 100 samples. Yeah. So here you can see that it's, or you know, it's a little finicky measuring time, but you can actually measure the, the, um, pulses more easily. In this case, there's no noise on here. You would have some noise, but Audacity is another way of viewing this. And then once you, ca so typically what you do is you'd capture the signal, 
pull it up on Audacity or something, look at it for a simpler thing. For more, more complex things, ideally, you'd have a specification for the signal. You can pull that up and then write something to process it, and you can test that, too. Um, and then lastly, talk about complex signals. Um, okay, yes, there's actually... So there, uh, Jared Boone, he wrote, he does software-defined radio stuff, too, with the HackRF. He made the porta pack which is actually an LCD uh, m module, like a shield for Arduino, that goes on top of it. And it will, and it gives you an FFT. It actually has a computation in the um, HackRF, which is really cool. And it will give you an FFT on there and let you demodulate audio. So this is quadrature radio or quadrature sampling. So on this axis, you have the I or in phase, which is the real value. In engineering, they use uppercase I for real and Q for quadrature, which is imaginary. So what happens if we look at the signal from the side? And in this case, it'd be like looking at this just with just measuring the amplitude. We see this. So right now, this is what's called phase shift keying, which is where the frequency of the signal stays the, s stays the same for the most part. Um, in this case, it stays the same, we'll say. And you just essentially shift the signal over by ch and change the phase. So what happens is you'd say that, OK, the phase change, that's a 1. There's no phase change, that's a 0. Here's a phase change, that's a 1. Um, phase is all relative, so you have to say if there's a change or something like that. Because without it, you don't know. You need something to reference the phase, too. Um, and, but then with complex signaling, or complex sampling, and complex numbers, we actually look at this as a circle because it's effectively you multiply it by a sine wave and a cosine wave to get this signal. So it'll form a circle at one. And for AM, so for AM radio, what happened is as this, this spirals around, you'd see it wiggle in and out based on the data. For FM, the speed of it changes. So the speed of it going around is frequency. The distance from the center is amplitude. And then what will happen is if we look at the complex signal, we can see that a change in direction tells us the phase. Do you have any questions on that? It's a little confusing, and the, it's hard. It's, when you understand it, it's actually pretty cool, but it's hard to understand. So let's see. Here's my presentation. Um, here's some additional resources. Um, GreatScottGadgets.com slash SDR. Um, that's the website by Michael Osman. He makes the HackRF, and this is a, a multi-part video series on GNU radio and software-defined radio. Radio Reference is, they don't do really software-defined radio stuff. They just list a bunch of frequencies of a bunch of different things. Um, RTLSDR.com, it's a blog website that does a lot of stuff with this, but they also talk about other SDR stuff. And SDR.ninja, talks about some radios and has um, links to uh, on Amazon where you can buy antennas and stuff. Um, yeah. you have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, I think about a year-ish. Yeah, about a year. And actually, if you see, and then th this is where I got some of the images from. And this I didn't cover. This is the RDS stuff for FM radio, so the radio data system. Um, and Michael Osman, Jared Boone, and Russ Handorf, I'd like to thank them. And I'm on GitHub. And here's my email and Twitter account if you want to contact me. Thank you. Thank you.